In our present survey of the cultural scenario in the subcontinent during the Mauryan period, let us proceed with a study of languages and literature. There is little doubt that the Mauryan period was connected with the study of Sanskrit language. This classical language had already been well established in the subcontinent, particularly in the northern part of the subcontinent, even before the arrival of the Mauryas. The Maurya period, or perhaps the very last phase of the Maurya period, witnessed the composition of a major commentary on the great Sanskrit work on grammar, the grammar of Panini. The commentary in early 2nd century BC on the grammar of Panini was composed by Patanjali. This commentary is known as the Mahabhashya, the great commentary on the Panini's grammar. It is likely that Sanskrit was the major language for writing technical treatises and religious texts, particularly the Brahmanical religious texts. We cannot forget that at least a part of the earliest portions of the Arthashastra could have been composed in 3rd century BC, a period when the Mauryas were ruling over the subcontinent. But at the same time, another form of Shastric literature could have been in vogue, the Dharma Sutras, in which we find the first attempt at codification of social norms, customs, usages on the basis of the Vedic ideology or Brahmanical ideology were being composed between 4th century BC and 2nd century BC, a period that roughly covers the Mauryan times. However, the most interesting aspect of language and literature is the existence of Prakrit language. The Mauryan period is marked by a very decisive and clear preference by Ashoka for Prakrit language to Sanskrit for writing his messages on stone and also rock surfaces. There were varied types of different dialects of Prakrit languages marked by regional features, which are plainly visible if one scans the peculiarities of language of the edicts of Ashoka. So, once again, we find a diversity in the linguistic scenario. Ashoka also used to non-Indian languages for the northwestern part of his realm, namely Aramaic and Greek. Once again, that speaks of linguistic diversity. It is most likely that greater parts of peninsular India and perhaps the farthest south was familiar with the use of Dravidian languages, though Ashoka did not use any Dravidian language for the dissemination of his ideas, his instructions in peninsular part of India. The familiar feature of diversity and plurality is quite evident. There were certainly Brahmanas following Brahmanical religion, perhaps also the performance of Vedic religion, perhaps the cult of sacrifices about which Ashoka is completely silent. But at the same time, we find clear mention of the Jainas under the name Nirgrantha, the Ajivikas. Both Jainas and Ajivikas, like the Buddhists, belong to the Shramanic order and they were definitely against the Brahmanical ideology. The Ajivikas and the Jainas often joined debates against 
Buddhists. That, however, did not prove any detriment to Ashoka's donating cave shelters to the Ajivikas, as we have already pointed out. Ashoka himself was aware of canonical Buddhist texts. He explicitly mentioned seven canonical texts. We have already told how Ashoka was concerned by the a possibility of the breakup in the Sangha. This has two aspects. Ashoka was very concerned to keep intact the integrity of the Sangha. At the same time, it also shows that there were dissenting voices within the Sangha. Therefore, even in the organized Buddhist monastic life, there could have been multiple religious philosophical positions. As you have already said, Ashoka is celebrated in later Buddhist literature as a great patron of Buddhism. He is credited with construction of 84,000 stupas. He is credited of sending missions for propagation of Buddhism to Sri Lanka. Particularly, this is remembered in the Sri Lankan Buddhist chronicles. According to the Buddhist texts of later times, it was during the time of Ashoka that the second great Buddhist council, Sangiti, was convened. Of different religions of this time, Buddhism obviously looms large in the Pali literature, also in later Avadana texts and to a certain extent in the edicts of Ashoka. There must have been other kinds of religious beliefs and practices, particularly current among the forest dwellers, the shepherds, knitters, who belong to a society and culture not confined to the settled society in villages and in urban areas. The very large number of terracotta figurines associated with the Maurya times, often showing the figures of female goddesses may speak of the continuity of the propitiation of these female figurines in the so-called tribal world of the forest dwellers, of the pastoralists, of the hunting gathering groups that lived in the Mauryan period, period along with cultivators, artisans, merchants, court elites and other religious leaders. For the first time in Indian history, since the demise of the Harappan civilization in the late second millennium BC or in the around 1800 BC, we rarely came across the regular use of stone as a material for visual arts. The Mauryas are to be credited with the introduction of stone both for sculpting and partly for architecture in Indian history on a very sustained basis. Rock cut architecture in the form of artificial cave shelters. These cave shelters were donated in the Barabar caves, Nagarjuna hill area near Gaya. The caves were donated once by Ashoka, then later by one of his late successors, Dasharatha, in favor of the Ajivika monks. The gate has a decorative frieze of elephants, nicely carved out. From the excavations at Kumrahar have been found remains of the Mauryan royal palace. There are indications that there was a devastating fire that led to the destruction of the largely wood-built royal palace of the Mauryas. Pataliputra excavations at Kumrahar have also yielded remains of a very large assembly hall where stood many columns, pillars, colonnades. This has been identified as some kind of a Darbar hall during the Mauryan period. The Mauryan hall of audience 
could have been inspired by similar large royal halls in the capital of the Achaemenid rulers of Iran. The Mauryas could have been influenced by this kind of halls, audience halls in the Achaemenid realm, which was their immediate predecessor in the northwestern borderland area. However, the most significant aspect of visual art of the Mauryan period is the sculpture. The famous Ashokan pillars are themselves sculptures. These can be viewed from all sides, carved out of a single stone and these stones essentially came from the Chunar sandstone which were quarried in Chunar area lying to the west of Varanasi. The Mauryan columns have a tall tapering shape. These are freestanding. The outer surface is left without any decoration. The bare surface is given a typical Mauryan polish like a mosaic floor. At the top of the tapering pillar, one sees a square or a round element which is called an abacus. Below the abacus comes the third element in the shape of an upturned lotus petal. It is also called a bell capital. Above this usually stands a majestic figure of an animal, the crowning element of the entire pillar. Sometimes the crowning animal is the figure of a lion, a single lion as one can see at the pillar at Vaishali or at Lauriya Nandangar. Sometimes one can see quadruple lions packed together as in the case of the very famous Sadnath pillar capital or a figure of a bull in the case of the pillar at Rampurva or an elephant figure as we find on the top of the pillar at Sankissa. First one immediately is impressed by the ability of the Mauryan sculptor to grasp the anatomical details of each and every animal, particularly the power, the majesty of the lion, which is in fact a symbol of Maurya political authority, the gaping face of the quadruple lion, the tense muscle of the feet, the stylized manes of the lion, the frontal treatment static is a bit awe-inspiring because it represents the Mauryan authority itself. The abacus also holds a number of sculptured panels in relief. This is in contrast to the sculpture in the round on the top of the pillar. Sometimes one sees floral motifs, designs, a pack of geese almost going around the abacus. In pleasing contrast to the static pose of the four lions, one also sees the figure of a bull wonderfully modeled. Next comes the figure of a majestic lion, then the figure of an elephant and then a horse on the trot. Now interestingly, all these figures are shown in high relief and not in full round sculptures and each of these animals are imparted with a very clear sense of movements. In between the moving anim animals are the intermediate figures of the Dharma Chakra symbol, wheels with spokes, a beautiful figure of the elephant, extremely elegant stands at Dholi near Bhuvaneshwar. It is apparently a small figure, only half of the figure of the elephant is there, given an impression that the elephant is coming out of a cave. The elephant here at Kalingo, where Ashoka perpetrated a major bloody war, the elephant stands almost in deference to the people of Kalinga with the with a very graceful downward movement of the trunk. There is also another interesting elephant figure near Kalsi in Dehradun which has yielded 
Ashokan inscriptions, Gajatame, the best of the elephants, possibly meaning the Buddha himself, because the Buddha appears in the dream of Maya Devi as an elephant cub. The Mauryan art was made by the artists employed by the court in order to highlight some of the policies, the interests, the philosophies that Ashok tried to disseminate through his program of Dhamma in his edicts. Outside these figures, there is another remarkable figure of the Mauryan times. This is a female figure coming from Didarganj in Bihar and the female figure is celebrated under the name the Didarganj Yakshini. This is a standing figure, once again standing figure in the full round that is it is can be viewed from all angles and it is not composed in relief. It is a figure of a standing female wearing a thin diaphanous cloth with the upper part of the torso completely bare. The lady has a fine coiffer, wears a number of ornaments including a very long necklace that has an elongated appearance placed between the two well developed rounded breasts. She also wears fine jewelries as ear ornaments and there is an almost inviting smile on her lips. That this is a Mauryan period product is evident from the typical Mauryan shining polish on this sculpture. There must have been a highly organized sector that arranged for the querying of the stone then the fashioning of the stone, then the transportation of the stone from a single center to different parts of the vast realm when the pillars were transported in different parts. All these could not have been possible but for a direct participation by the court. Since it was a court art and designed for a particular purpose, it also died rather quickly with the demise of the Mauryan political authority. It rarely left any legacy behind it. After the death of Ashok in 232 BC, the Mauryan Empire collapsed in a dramatic fashion within less than 50 years of Ashoka's death. Mauryan Empire was no more after 187 or 185 BC. What led to this sudden decay and collapse of such a mighty power, particularly after the empire reached its zenith under the nearly four decades of rule of Ashoka? It is a debatable issue and has been analyzed by various historians obviously offering different explanations. Haraprasad Shastri, a well-known Sanskritist, suggested that the problem lay even during the days of Ashoka. He considered that Ashoka's policy of Dhamma was definitely directed against the Brahmanas. The Brahmanas sharply reacted to it and ultimately at the end of the Maurya rule, the Brahmana Senapati or commander in chief Pushyamitra Sunga overthrew the last of the Maurya rulers Brihadrata. In fact, interestingly, this account figures not in a Maurya period source but in a much later Sanskrit text the Harsha Charita of Banavatta. However, the analysis of Shastri leaves many questions unanswered. We have already seen that Ashoka's policy of Dhamma was definitely not directed against Brahmanism and against the Brahmanas. In fact, it had almost no sectarian approach. It was very broad based. 
Therefore, the policy of Dhamma could not have put the Brahmanas in a discontented position. So, that explanation is virtually out. H. C. Rai Choudhury, the very well known historian and writer of the famous book Political History of Ancient India, once very sharply accused Ashoka once again for policy of Dhamma. Once again, this interpretation requires rethinking, in fact, a rejection. We have analyzed Ashoka's Dhamma. He definitely underlined the importance of nonviolence. He eschewed war, but there is absolutely no shred of evidence to suggest that Maurya army was disbanded, that Ashoka was a pacifist ruler and in fact lost his firm control over the management of the affairs of the state. Far from it, Ashoka appears even when propagating his Dhamma policy as a very firm and able administrator. One cannot forget how Ashoka in no uncertain terms admonished the forest dwellers, the Atavikas. This is not the voice of a weak ruler, nor a pacifist ruler, nor a dreamer. After all, this was the idea of a single individual. Therefore, Ashoka's policy of Dhamma was never continued. It was a great experiment, but experiment during only one reign. There could have been other social and economic causes, particularly economic causes. As Romila Thapar points out, that the very large number of royal functionaries and maintenance of a large army required enormous amount of resources. These resources could be gathered by mobilizing agricultural resources that provided the most important avenue of tax collection. The Mauryas were not able to expand the agricultural resource base in a sufficient manner that would be conducive to the maintenance of a very large number of officers and also a large army. Therefore, the Mauryas often tried to mobilize the resources from the peripheral areas to the advantage of the metropolitan state of Magadha. So, there lay an imbalance. This imbalance could have created in later days serious problems in the structure of administration and the imperial fabric. Along with that, soon after the demise of Ashoka, Around 200 BC, the northwestern frontier areas experienced invasions from the Bactrian Greek rulers. The memory of this is retained in the grammatical treatise of Patanjali, the Mahavashya, that we have already referred earlier, and also in the Yuga Purana that spoke of the Yavana invasion. The memory of the Yavanas capturing Saketa in the Ganga Valley, an integral part of the Mauryan Empire. The arrival of the Yavanas at Madhyamika, which is Chitor in Rajasthan, once again forming a part of the Mauryan Empire, could have dealt a major blow to the integrity of the Mauryan Empire. There could have been also harsh treatment on the part of the Mauryan officers. One can recall the story in the Dibhyavadana that there were high-handed officers, Dushtamatya at Takshashila, and there were popular discontent against their misrule. Ashoka was sent 
by his father Bindusara, according to the story, to pacify the discontent people of Taxila. So, all this could have led to the ongoing problem for the maintenance of the fabric of the Mauryan Empire. Finally, around 187 BC, the Mauryan Empire collapsed when the Brahmana general of the Mauryas, Senapati Pushyamitra, overthrew the last of the Mauryan rulers, Brihadratha, 185 BC. In fact, we do not know exactly how many kings came after Ashoka. There are various lists in the Puranas. At least one ruler of the post Ashokan period is known. His name is Dasharatha. Perhaps these rulers were not of the caliber of the three first powerful rulers of the Maurya dynasty, like Chandragupta Maurya, Bindusaro, and Ashoka himself. All this compounded to the problem which finally brought down the Mauryan power in 187 or 185 BC with the exit of the last ruler Brihadratha. As we said, the Mauryan empire is not a long-lasting empire, only 140 years. But the Mauryan period is a landmark in Indian history. For the first time, greater parts of the subcontinent is brought under the rule of a single paramount political power. That power also provided a strong administrative machinery and it worked at least for the three first three rulers of the dynasty. And above all, in the policy of Dhamma, the Mauryas gave us the values, the attitude to respect and to practice diversity, plurality, yet under a common arch, overarching principle of Dhamma. This is perhaps the most important gift the Mauryas gave to Indian history.